Well, God bless you. I bring you greetings from Summit, where Jesus is doing incredible things in the lives of young men and women from all around the world, and you make that possible by owning us as your Bible school. Thank you for that. And if God's presence in the house wasn't enough tonight, uh, if you want to know how much the Lord desires to speak to you, I woke up yesterday and today with laryngitis. I could barely talk. Uh, out of nowhere, I had to teach a class this morning and muscled through that. I was worried. I contemplated calling Pastor Tim and saying, I can't talk and I don't know what to do. And God has touched my voice. I don't know. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. So that's how much the Lord wants to speak to you tonight. And the title of the message is, Your Tears Are Satan's Doom. Your Tears Are Satan's Doom. And we're going to read from Revelation chapter 20 tonight. So open that in your Bible or your Bible app and keep it open in front of you. Because before we read our text, I need to tell you how this word came to my heart. Because I'd been praying for you, praying for tonight, asking God to give me something from heaven so that you could be fed as his people and nothing was coming. Until this past Sunday when my son told me about a really interesting and even unsettling experience that he had in church. He's eight years old. Um, he is crazy. Uh, he is a typical eight-year-old boy, very short attention span, but he loves Jesus. And every now and then he'll calm down enough to have a really deep and honest conversation with me. And this past Sunday in church during worship, he felt a very sudden sadness come upon him. And he couldn't really say what it was or why it was. And I'm talking to him about it, asking him questions, trying to get a feel for what maybe caused it. He could maybe identify that he felt guilty. So we talked about Jesus' forgiveness. And what we ultimately landed on was that that was just the devil attacking him. The devil was just attacking him during worship and trying to get him to doubt God's love for him. And the sadness was so strong. And again, it came out of nowhere. He couldn't understand why he was feeling what he was feeling. It brought him to tears. He started crying in church, and it wasn't because he felt touched by the Lord. He just felt sad for no reason. And after we got done talking about it and, and talking about how this is the enemy, you can command him to stop, I quoted Psalm 50, uh, 56, 8 to him, and I said, you know, buddy, the Bible says that God bottles all of our tears. David wrote in Psalm 56, you yourself have recorded my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? I said, God has all of your tears in a bottle, and he writes down every time you cry and every reason you cry. His eyes got real big. He said, really? I said, yeah, he does. And then in typical eight-year-old fashion, we did a sharp right into another conversation, and this devious smile crossed his face, and he said, ah, then the devil's going to get his punishment. And I'm thinking, I don't know how that connects with what I just told you. And I'm laughing, of course, because it was funny. It was very funny, very random. But the Holy Spirit challenged me as I'm laughing at what he said because I realized, I don't know why David wrote that. I don't know what else was going on in that psalm that prompted him to reflect on God bottling his tears. So I went to the psalm and I read the whole thing and I realized my son was right. There is a connection to the enemy there. The whole psalm is about David being delivered from the power of his enemies. And he writes about God recording his tears, putting them in a bottle and preserving them as a future testimony against his enemies. That there would come a day when God would hold his enemies accountable for tormenting and harassing him and trying to kill him. And those tears were going to be the evidence used to indict them and hold them accountable for what they did. And I looked at my eight-year-old. He's already into Minecraft. He's left the conversation. I'm like, Noah, you were right. And he's like, I was? And so he got very excited when I told him that God used him to give me my message for tonight. So he, he, felt, very, uh, he felt very significant in that. But, you know, David's comfort, again, in that psalm, it wasn't so much that God is kind. His comfort was that God is just. His comfort was that God is just. And this is our foundational point for the rest of the message tonight. Recording David's tears was very significant. Why? Because it was a promise of judgment against his enemies. Bottling and recording David's tears was a promise of judgment against his enemies, that one day the people, the enemies that were chasing him and trying to end his life were going to be held accountable by an almighty God for what they were doing to him. His weeping would be vindicated and redeemed. And for us as Christians, the promise of God's future judgment against evil is meant to give us hope. We're meant to derive strength from that reality. 
My son had a miraculous connection in his mind. I don't know how conscious he was of that. He just wanted to talk through emotions that he couldn't understand or articulate. I'm looking at it. I'm saying, this is a revelation from the Lord. And God led us to that moment because he wants to tell you tonight, all your tears are bottled. He sees the moments where you've been made to weep by the harassment of Satan in your life. He sees where Satan is touching your family, touching your personal life, hitting you in your emotions and trying to bring you to your knees and bring you to the end of your walk with God. But he's promising you there's a day coming. There's a day coming when vengeance will be his and your enemy is going to be humiliated for every time he tried to trample on your faith. But that supernatural connection that happened in my son's mind and this kind of mysterious, illuminating truth I found in the psalm, it's actually a very well-documented but little-known Bible doctrine. This truth that I'm talking to you about tonight is all throughout Scripture. And that's the journey that I want to take you on tonight because what I want you to understand is that both testaments, old and new, both testaments tell us two things. Both testaments tell us that God's future judgment of evil should give us hope. We've already established that. But there's a second part. Both Testaments tell us that we will participate in that future judgment. It's not just that God is going to hold our enemies accountable. He's actually going to let you hold them accountable. You're going to hold Satan accountable someday and sit in a judgment seat against him. And this is not an isolated verse in the Bible. This is a theme that runs from Old through New Testament. But we don't know what to do with these verses a lot, so they kind of get skipped over, maybe interpreted in a way that doesn't sound so strange. But tonight, we're going to take them at face value, and I hope give you a radically different picture of what your future destiny is. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp, and that's it for eternity. Okay, the, the first couple thousand years, however long it takes, is actually going to be spent in God's courtroom holding every devil and demon accountable for every act of evil they ever did. And you get to participate in that. So let's read Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. John writes and says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Praise be to God. Now the most critical feature that we need to focus on tonight for this teaching is actually the thrones of verse 4. Jesus is not the only one seated on a throne in this millennial reign. That's what it's called, this thousand-year period that John saw coming in the future. It's actually a group of thrones. Jesus is the preeminent throne ruling over all, but then his people are seated with him. And they've been given authority to judge. Now, when you first read the text, it looks as though this is only the martyrs the souls of those who came back to life because they'd not worshiped the beast or his image. 
But I want to suggest to us tonight that that's symbolic language. The martyr language is to show us that the faithful to Christ in every generation, regardless of the cost, they are going to reign with him on the earth and they're going to participate in his judgment against evil. And it, you don't need no degree or nothing to do this. You just got to have Jesus. And you're going to get a throne and you're going to get to hold evil accountable. And this is a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. If this interests you, you go back and read that chapter and see all the parallels between Daniel 7 and what's happening in Revelation 20. In Daniel 7, there's a prophecy about God Almighty setting up thrones that his son and his saints will sit on as they rule over an everlasting kingdom. But I want to give you some reasons why the martyr language is symbolic language. Because again, it's not just in Revelation and it's not just in Psalm 56 that you see this topic come up. Scripture guarantees this future to all of God's people. Not just one verse. Scripture as a whole guarantees it to all God's people. First and most authoritatively, Jesus promised it. Jesus promised it twice. In Matthew 19 and in Luke 22, he tells the disciples, you're going to sit with me on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's speaking to the churches and he says, he who overcomes, I will give him a throne so that he can rule with me over the nations. Not only did Jesus promise it, Paul proclaimed it. Paul proclaimed to the whole Corinthian church that they're going to judge the world and angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's right there, verses 1 through 3. There is no fancy interpretation. It's face value. Guess what, guys? You're going to judge the world, and you're going to judge angelic beings, both good and bad. I don't know what that looks like. I have no idea what that's going to entail, but I'm really looking forward to finding out. I'm excited about this. We're not just going to float on clouds and play harps. We are going to help Jesus Bring perfect justice to this broken world as he restores it and makes it perfect and brand new. We're going to help bring in the new creation. It's not just down here. We're laboring and toiling and, and waiting for some distant realm that we're going to go to. No, God's going to bring heaven down to this earth. And you're going to help bring it in. That's your job. Jesus promised it. Paul proclaimed it. Jude prophesied it. In his letter, in verses 14 and 15, he quotes the prophet Enoch from the Old Testament, and he tells his audience that they're going to help Jesus judge false teachers. They're going to help Jesus judge false teachers. So the Jude prophesies it, Jesus promises it, Paul proclaims it, and the psalmist sings about it. Not just Psalm 56. I want you to listen to Psalm 149, verses 5 through 9. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This honor is for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. Now, as New Testament Christians, we know from Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We, get, we wrestle against spiritual powers of evil that are making war against the kingdom of God. And so when I read that psalm and I see that there's a future commission for God's people to carry out his judgment, I understand exactly what Jesus, Paul, and Jude were talking about. We are going to be used someday to sit next to Jesus in the millennium and we're going to hold Satan accountable for the evil that he's committed. That's our future. And these thrones that we see, the thrones that we see in chapter 20 verse 4 are very significant again because they're still present after Satan is released. There's this interlude where the millennial kingdom is set up, Jesus is reigning with his people, but then ooh, the devil's let out one more time. And he tries to make war against God. But he doesn't prevail in any way, shape, or form. The thrones that were set up in verse 4 are still present in verses 7 through 10. The reason that's important is because it shows us that we're not just going to, we're not just going to witness the destruction of Satan and his angels from afar. We're not going to get shaken once he escapes from his prison. No, our seat of authority, once we've been given it, it's not going away. He can't take it from us. You might feel shaken by him now, but there's a day coming where he's not going to be able to shake you at all. 
He might make you feel like you're at your wit's end today, but there's coming a day where his attacks are going to end in nothing more than humiliation for him and terror at his own destruction that Jesus is going to let you pronounce over him. That's exciting. I believe the Lord sent me here to tell you and to let you know that he sees your tears. He sees your tears. And there's a day coming where all of those tears are going to be used as judicial evidence against the enemy who's trying to destroy you. You're not just going to witness the destruction of Satan someday. You're going to joyfully and judicially participate in that destruction. What's it going to be like to see our demonic enemies tremble in defeat as they're brought before the throne of God and the thrones of the saints? And I can just hear, if you'll permit me to use my imagination, I can hear God Almighty telling us the charges against them. This one was responsible for child trafficking in Eastern Asia. And the people of God are going to say, guilty. Another one's going to come forward. And the father is going to speak out and he's going to say, this one fueled hatred and racial bias and and violence in in the United States. And the people of God are going to say, guilty. And then he's going to get personal. He's going to look over and say, hey, Jim and Mary, this is the one that got your kids lost in sin for that season before I rescued them. Jim and Mary are going to say, guilty. And they get to condemn the enemy that's been after their family and after their life. Powers of darkness that fueled fear, violence, suicide, addiction, greed, corruption, abuse, lust, and genocide are going to be brought before the church in utter humiliation, and the church will have the honor of condemning them. That's your future. That's your destiny. Every spirit is going to stand before God and be held accountable for its evil, be held accountable to the Lamb and to the saints. Because as the psalmist says, this is the honor for all of his godly ones. Right now, we're in a place where it's easy to make us cry. Satan knows our nerves. He knows where we're weak. He knows where we're vulnerable. And some of you have been weeping a lot lately. It's been hurting. Life has been very hard. And I'm not here to give you a a specific word for your situation and tell you the solution and what you ought to do. If I had that, I would give it to you. What I feel the Lord's given me to do tonight is to tell you he sees those tears. He sees those tears and he's bottling them and he's storing them up because if you'll again permit me to be a bit imaginative, I can see the day where Satan's brought before us. He's brought in front of you and Jesus holds up the jar of tears that he's been collecting throughout your lifetime. And as you list the charges and indictments against the enemy, because he's a liar, he just begins objecting. I never did that. That's not true. They were weak. They didn't trust you. And all of a sudden, the judge stands up and says, oh, no, I was there. I saw what you did. I saw everything you did to make them cry. This is all the evidence against you. And he pours out that bottle. And he says, I wrote down every time you touched their life. I wrote down every time you touched their family. And the day of your judgment has come. You see, Jesus has erased every record of your wrongs, but he's keeping track of Satan's. He's keeping track of Satan's. And we're going to go through seasons in this life, beloved, where our pain goes without explanation. We're not always going to have answers. You're not always going to understand what you're supposed to learn from the things that you're going through. Sometimes the only thing you're going to be able to do is cry and cry out to God for grace And the assurance that he gives us in those seasons is that there's a day coming when everything's going to be made right and every wrong is going to be answered for and justice is going to be served. And that's the honor that's given to every saint. Your father, listen close, your father keeping record of your sorrows is the same thing as him keeping record of Satan's wrongs. Your father keeping record of your sorrows is the same thing as him keeping record of Satan's wrong. And one day he's going to pay. One day he's going to be held accountable. Satan will be held accountable for every evil act that he's ever committed against you. He gets away with nothing. It might hurt today, but it's going to be very worth it tomorrow. It might hurt in this life. We might have to endure the challenges of satanic attack. We might have to endure the grief of unexplained pain. But there is coming a day when our enemy is going to be humiliated, defeated, and condemned. 
and it's going to be your voice that speaks his sentence. It's going to be your voice that sentences him to eternity in that lake of fire and sulfur. That's how God is going to honor and crown your faithfulness to him. Don't give up, beloved. Keep running. Keep fighting. Don't back down. Don't let go of faith. Jesus will not fail you. The God that we felt in this room tonight, he is with you every day. When the music stops and there is no feeling, his presence is with you. And he's bottling every tear. He's writing every one of them down in his book. And someday, those tears are going to be poured out as evidence against the accuser of our souls. And he will have no defense. No defense whatsoever. It's going to be worth it, folks. It's going to be worth it all. I don't like suffering. I don't like pain. I don't like crying. But I trust Jesus enough to know I have no reason to back down from the fight. I have no reason to back down from this fight. And neither do you. Neither do you. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. I want to invite the worship team to make their way back to the platform and all of us to stand together in the house. When you look at this promise this promise of participating with Jesus in his judgment of evil. Every verse that we looked at tonight, I only reference them. I only reference them. The words of Jesus, the words of Paul and Jude. I encourage you, go back and look at those verses. Every time this promise is talked about, it's coupled with a command about how to order our Christian lives. Jesus talks about the importance of not seeking human greatness Paul talks about why we should be ready to forgive and cover wrongs rather than try to drag each other to, to human courts and hold every person accountable for every injustice they commit against us. They're always coupled with a command. Why? Because this promise is meant to give us hope. It tells us how to order our lives. We're meant to respond in faith and in obedience. If we know how good the future looks, we have no reason to be despondent in the present. We have no reason to give up in this moment. And maybe the Lord is speaking to you tonight. Tonight he's focusing on renewing your reason to fight. If the devil's been attacking your fight, if he's been attacking your faith, then as we begin to sing, I want you to make your way to the front. Just ask the Lord to refresh your heart. Ask him to renew your fight. Ask him to put the fire back in your bones. To not back down from an enemy that you have authority over. To not back down from an enemy that Jesus has already defeated on your behalf. Come down and remind the devil of his future tonight. Don't just cry over what he's doing to you now. You remind him of what he has waiting for him. He might be mocking you today, but you're going to be judging him in a tomorrow that's coming very, very soon. And maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you found your way in here. You were invited. I don't know. Maybe you've been coming for a while. You're curious. God is showing you the future that could be yours if you'll give him your life. This is what he wants to give to all of his people. And maybe you're a backslider tonight. You, you were a Christian, but you've been away from the Lord. It's time to come home. Jesus wants to take you back. You see, because of sin, we're destined for the same fate that Satan is. But Jesus died so he could take God's wrath against our sin on himself. And now we can be forgiven and free. And instead of suffering the fate of Satan, we get to put him in that fate. And we escape it. We live with eternity in our hearts. And we live at the right hand of God and of the Lamb forever and ever. Jesus wants to change your destiny tonight. So if God's speaking to you and you need him to do a work in your life tonight, I want you to make your way to the front. I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to turn it over to the worship team. Lord Jesus, I've spoken what you spoke to me. God, I thank you that your word is true and it's powerful. God, we thank you for this promise that we probably don't talk about often enough, oh God. Lord, the future that you have waiting for us. God, it's not just endlessly sitting on a cloud and playing a heart, the stereotype that fills our minds. God, it's infinitely better than that. God, you're calling us to stand beside you someday and to work with you in bringing your perfect justice to your new creation. God, I thank you that a day is coming when all evil is going to be held accountable. Lord, no one is going to get away with anything. People might escape. Evil might escape justice in this life. They might escape the broken systems of human justice in this life. But no act of evil will escape your perfect justice, oh God. We thank you for that. 
And Lord, we take hope in that tonight. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who need to be renewed for the battle at hand. God, flood them with your power tonight. Renew them in the Holy Spirit. Put a fresh fire in their bones, oh God, and teach them how to make war against the enemy of their souls. They are not powerless in this fight. They have authority in their prayers. They have authority because of who they are in Christ. Jesus, I pray, teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight just like you did for David, oh God, that we would rebuke the accuser, that we would remind him of his fate, oh God, and that we would not be intimidated by his attacks on our lives. God, I pray that you would bottle tears tonight and you would comfort hearts and remind them, oh Lord, that you see everything and a day of justice is coming. God, for any in the house tonight that are away from you, Lord, maybe those, even if it's one person who's never met you before, God, let tonight be the night they find themselves in your embrace and their eternity changing, oh God. We love you and we look to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.